You can go to the freeway, close your eyes and run across the freeway and live. But how many times can you do that? That's definitely it's on what but what you terug bring what you say I will nog and I will nog. But you do not on that that geestelijk iets for you doen that bring a bring a calm to you what what for me very lekker is. So this is amper om so som kerk toe te gaan denk ek. You need every ounce of will to want to live to survive a lot of these dives. For me, it's word liver for my technical body. Liver is what means can work for my wife and also for your family. The reason for this is you have a lot of time to do cases under the water. And as it's wrong, you know what you can yourself out but not your body. It's the hardest decision in your life that you can make a choice. And in the first time, you have to make a choice. And the right choice is not always the truth. And people on the other side can't understand it. This is me looking intense and trying to work out how I got involved in this game. This place is called Wonnergat. A natural sinkhole somewhere between Lichtenberg and Muffy King in the African bushveld. It is as old as the mountains. It has been here, like this, for the last 2,200 million years. In less than the last blink of its life, it's become one of the most popular inland dive sites in South Africa. And also the one where the most fatalities have occurred. You see, Wonnergat is deep with an underwater cave which starts at 40 meters and then goes down and round an elbow to a place aptly called the back of the cave at about 60 meters. But why do people die here? And why do divers keep coming back? Ask Nuno Gormish, the world's deepest ever scuba diver and also the world's deepest ever cave diver. It's actually a very complex diving uh, venue which people are underestimating, and that's why the, the, the divers are dying here. You know, you get open water one divers going to the end of the cave, which is at about 60 meters. So they qualify to go to about 18 meters, but now they're going 50 meters deep, and then they're going 60 meters into a cave to a maximum depth of 60 meters. And that's why they die. In diving terms, 50 meters is a magical barrier. And I've come to Wonnergat to try and go beyond that, to see what it is that make people want to go there. Johan Bosov has not only been my instructor, but also my dive buddy for many, many dives. Technical diving creates a bond between buddies, unlike any I have found on dry land. At this point, before a serious dive, the need for talking gets less and less. We spend the time thinning across, running through the dive plan in our minds. A last safety check completes the ritual before we enter the spiritual world of sign language. For me, this personal journey started nine years ago when I witnessed a diving tragedy, or actually two years before that. I'm one of those idiots who've always been inexplicably drawn to those things in life that scare me most. That was how I started skydiving in 1994. And in the same year, when an environmental television program said that one of the things they were looking for in a new presenter was the ability to scuba dive, I lied without thinking twice. After all, if I can swim and jump out of an aeroplane, how difficult can this scuba thing be? I got the job, but I couldn't be more wrong. The first diving story I had to work on then came in 1996, looking for the highly endangered seahorse in the Neisner Lagoon. As I've never dived, I had to fake my way through it, imitating everyone around me, pretending that I'd been diving all my life. The first few dives were really shallow and gave me the opportunity to check out all the gadgets. I was a bit nervous though.
I'm sure the real divers quickly clicked that I hadn't a clue. But in the spirit of the brotherhood I would get to know so well later on, they all helped me to hide it from the producer and the camera. And just when I thought I was getting away with it, we were told to go and dive in the deep end of the lagoon. It was the first time I had seen fish underwater, and almost immediately I was bewitched by this strange, quiet world, where the only sound is a translated bubble rhythm of your own breathing. And yes, we did find the seahorse. Unfortunately, amidst all the excitement, I forgot to check my air supply and almost drowned. I had never heard of buddy breathing before. Panicked and went straight to the top from the bottom, somehow without killing myself. It was only much later that I would realize just how lucky and stupid I had been. But I promised myself to do a proper course before the next dive. It is one year later and my first visit to Sodwana Bay. As things go, I only got round to do one theory lesson and one swimming pool session since Neisner. But I'm not here to dive. We are covering an expedition by a group of deep technical divers who are looking for the long thought to be extinct coelacanth at depths of over 100 meters. Normal sports divers stick to depths shallower than 20 meters. Advanced divers are allowed to go to 30. And anything below 40 is considered deep or technical diving. At 100 plus meters, these are extreme dives. The air we breathe consists mainly of about 78% nitrogen and 22% oxygen. Past 30 meters, the nitrogen becomes narcotic. And past 60, the oxygen starts to get toxic. And that's why these people then start to dilute it with other gases like helium, a process called trimix diving. Erna Smith explains. They will also have to do long decompression stops to get as much of the excessive nitrogen they breathed in at depth out of their bodies to avoid the deadly decompression sickness, or as it is commonly known, the bends. They use two boats with a doctor on board and also a team of backup divers. The margin for error is extremely small and the slightest miscalculation can be fatal. Expedition leader Rian Bauer and Peter Tim, one of the other divers, will take turns over the next few days to take our camera down with him. It takes only a few minutes to get to 100 meters. After eight minutes at 120 meters, they start the ascent. They will spend more than an hour decompressing on the way up, doing the last shallow stop on almost pure oxygen to try and get as much of the nitrogen out of their blood as possible. The deeper they go, the darker it gets as the sunlight battles to penetrate the dense seawater. Looking at the bubbles from the top feels like a lifetime, and I have to admit that I'm greatly relieved when they all return safely, even though they didn't find a coelacanth. Back in camp, their preparations start immediately for the next day's dive. With each diver carrying five cylinders and dual inflation devices, there are many things to check before and after each dive. One faulty O-ring at depth could mean disaster. A special computer program helps to calculate the best dive profile according to mixes used, consumption rates of individual divers and planned maximum depth. Each diver checks and rechecks his or her own gear and it takes hours to complete the preparation. Then there is still the actual expedition planning deciding exactly where to go to try and find old forelegs. Waar de schaal van die kaart is en de beschrijving van alle punten, is hier een baie prominente rotsformatie wat hier zo uitsteekt. So, ik denk dat dit een baie interessante dijk is wat ons morgen hier zo gaan en ons behoort een redelijk, redelijke goede inlichting ook te krijgen en ons behoort ook baie goede monsters te verzamelen. Hoe was het? Ja, baie lekker. Ja. Het is goed gegaan. Ja, het is baie interessant gegeven. Het was plat nog op 90 meter en toen val ik nu zo so af. Met 180 graden zo so af. Dat was zeker goed. My curiosity about this other world has certainly been stirred. But just watching them go down makes me very nervous. Diving on the continental shelf, 
means that there is an abyss that drops away for hundreds of meters beneath him. On the next dive, they had barely reached the bottom when Rian apparently realized that one of his cylinders had free flowed and was almost empty. He left the others below and raced to the top without any deco stops and once on the surface had a window period of about one minute in which to get a backup diver to go back down with him with a spare cylinder. Anxious minutes followed. And when the backup diver popped up seemingly unconscious and without Rian, we all knew we had big trouble. While the one boat waited for the others to surface, we immediately started searching. Things were beginning to look hopeless, but no one was admitting it. The sun zakt nu bij vannacht naar zijn maximum van nog twee uur waar voor het donker is hier. Dit betekent binnen die volgende twee uur moet ons omkrijgen. To make matters worse, the wind had started picking up, as it so often does in the afternoon in Sodwana. They dropped a boy off when they when he got missing. So I'm just going back to that boy then. I'm going a bit after it. The two hours rushed by and we had to eventually beach the boat in the dark. I'll never forget the feeling of knowing that we had to leave behind a diver who that very morning went out to sea with us. To make it even worse, I interviewed Rian just before the dive. And unknowingly heard him describe his own death hours before it happened. Rian's body was never found. Two days later, one of the other divers in the group decided the best medicine would be to take me on a shallow 12-meter dive on Sodwana's beautiful two-mile reef. I couldn't even remember the basics from my first and only theory lesson. I just did not want to be there. I wanted to be on dry land where no one could leave me behind. But, amazingly, my dive master managed to calm me down. And for the first time since the accident, once I started looking around, I actually managed to forget about the whole incident for a few minutes. Such is the magic of the underwater world. Never again would I lie about my diving abilities. But I was also more convinced than ever that I too wanted to be a diver. I went back and completed the basic open water course and followed it on with an advanced course. I then did my master diver, nitrox and advanced nitrox courses under my buddy Johan Bosov's instruction. Together we started diving most of the southern African coastline. Over the next few years I learned to dive. Slowly I was getting addicted to the underwater world. A world where you learn to appreciate every breath you take. I even stopped smoking and eating fish. My outlook on life has changed forever. And at the same time, I'm left with a yearning for the underwater world whenever I'm stuck on dry land. I have become a diver. The only worrying thing for me was that in spite of my promise to myself after Rian's drowning that I would stick to the shallower sports diving depths, I just kept going deeper and deeper. The nagging curiosity as to why people wanted to go really deep 
refused to go away. And eventually, I decided I will get the training and go beyond 50 meters to see for myself. There is an old Greek legend that dolphins carry the souls of those who drown at sea. A plaque was put up for Rian Bower at Two Mile Reef, and I'll certainly never forget him as long as I dive. Meet Miss Piggy. Miss Piggy is the hyperbaric chamber in Pretoria. This is where they recompress injured divers to try and save their lives from the bends. Johan wants to illustrate the effect of nitrogen narcosis to me before we go to Wonnergat to do the deep dives. There are two nurses inside with us and all the controls are on the outside. Basically, it is an artificial dive where they will take us down to 50 meters by increasing the pressure inside the chamber. We have to keep blocking our noses and then blowing, a process called equalizing that keeps the eardrums from rapturing from the increasing pressure, exactly like we would do on a normal dive. Nitrogen arcosis is also called the martini effect. Apparently, every 10 meters you go down is equivalent to having two martinis. At 50 meters, we've now had 10 each. The Donald Duck effect on our vocal cords due to the pressure adds to the party mood. The scary thing is, in Wonnergat, we'll be going to 60 meters. That's another two martinis each, inside a cave in complete darkness, and we have to make all the right decisions in this state of mind. There'll be no